Well, you see that uh, picture? I'll just get going anyway while you fix that. You know that picture of Paul that I had there? And you see a picture of Paul that I have uh, here. Uh, it's so humbling for me to be um, uh, selected to deliver the, a lecture in Paul's name. I've known Paul for about 30 years. He's sitting right here. Uh, and I knew him in the context of some of the early work on, uh, that he was doing on waiting lists and the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. And my main reflection from that time was he really set a model of integrity uh, in science and evidence-based focus. So I think it's very appropriate there's a lecture named after his name. Uh, my wife has also known Paul for about 30 years. Uh, she's a geriatrician. And so we were going for a walk uh, a few days ago. And I said, uh, Heather, what, um, what reflections do you have about, uh, about Paul Armstrong? And of course, she came up with much better reflections than I did. Her reflections were, uh, firstly, um, that Paul treated everyone with equal respect, regardless of whether they were a medical student or a cardiologist or a, a senior professor. And that really brought out the best in everybody. And that's relevant to this talk because we need to treat innovators with equal respect regardless of where they come from in the world and to value them for their ideas. Uh, the other thing that Heather always told me about Paul actually has uh, is an issue in work-life balance. And I don't know if you still do this, Paul, but every Friday night, uh, Paul, who is a very busy cardiologist working all the, all the time, would bring home a red rose to his wife. Uh, I, do you still do that? And so that's about 30 years worth of red roses. And that speaks to work-life balance, something that none of us are particularly good at, I don't think. Uh, and so in many, many ways, Paul, I think, can be an inspiration and an example for all of us, which is why it's so, uh, so humbling for me to be able to deliver this lecture in his name. And I'm very, very grateful for that uh, honor. Good. I think we covered this. So Paul, thank you very much. You're sitting right here. And just on behalf of everyone, uh, I just wanted to thank you for all the work you've done on behalf of the Academy and on behalf of uh, health science and medicine in, in Canada. So um, the challenge that I want you to think about is imagine that you were asked to solve global challenges. Uh, but you had limited time, limited money, and you were starting from a blank canvas. Um, that is effectively the challenge that um, we were given about uh, five years ago now, four and a half years ago at Grand Challenges Canada. So it was a way to start with a blank canvas and say, how would you use innovation to solve global challenges? And by the way, you should pick which ones you want to solve, uh, like survival of women and children, like child development, like mental health, and so on. And by global, uh, we're talking about the developing world, but we're also, as you'll see at the end of this talk, uh, using a sense of global that includes uh, domestic issues. And I'm going to come back to that. So this is the challenge, essentially, that we faced. And what I'd like to do in this talk is just share some of the lessons that we've learned. We've made lots of mistakes. We've had lots of failures. Um, but we have learned some things and I think move the needle forward a little bit on how to innovate. And those lessons, I think, are relevant for funders, but they're also relevant for innovators, which is what all of you are. And, uh, and that's really what I want to be the focus of, of the talk. The story for me went back to late 2002. And, you know, we often have these, all of us, these thrilling, pivotal moments in our lives. In 2002, I was a young boy uh, minding my own business. Uh, and I got a call from the Gates Foundation, and it was uh, Rick Klausner, who was leading global health at the time, and he said, you know that paper you guys just published in Nature Genetics, Top 10 Biotechnologies in Global Health? Well, we think the methodology could be useful for something Bill Gates wants to do. He wants to revisit the old David Hilbert concept from 100 years ago of setting grand challenges. Hilbert did them in mathematics and uh, do them in global health. So in early 2003, I found myself in a small unmarked office in D.C., Gates Foundation office with Rick, with Elias Sirhuni, who was running the NIH at the time, with Harold Varmus, with Patty Stonecipher. Um, and that was the beginning of a process that in late 2003 resulted in the identification of 14 challenges, seven goals, 
$500 million, ultimately a $1 billion has been invested by the Gates Foundation. Uh, to the credit of Canada, CIHR was one of the initial partners in this Gates Grand Challenge. And I, I don't have time to cover this in detail, just to say uh, that it was thrilling to be involved with. It ultimately uh, led to uh, 44 projects at an average of $10 million, and some of them now are coming to fruition in very interesting ways. Probably the most advanced is infecting uh, mosquitoes with a parasite called Wolbachia so they don't transmit dengue. And that's now in an advanced field trial stage, but it's a good example of transformative science taking a long time. Obviously, there's no real vaccine out for dengue, uh, et cetera, et cetera, no treatment. And it's okay the first time, but it's terrible the second time when you get dengue uh, hemorrhagic fever. So um, we learned a lot of lessons in this uh, original Grand Challenges. So um, uh, when uh, the other thrilling moment was in uh, February 2008, when again I was minding my own business, and some um, young person from the Department of Finance, mid-level person called, uh, whom we hadn't lobbied, and he said, uh, would you be able to speak with the Associate Deputy Minister today while the Minister's reading the budget? It was the day of the federal budget. And that was the budget measure in 2008 of the Development Innovation Fund. And he said, you know, we've been reading about the grand challenges in global health. It's inspiring. We think Canada should do one in its global uh, development envelope. So um, out came the Development Innovation Fund. Then a period of two years of work defining what that would look like. Um, an organization called Grand Challenges Canada was formed with a board of directors chaired by Joe Rotman. I uh, would very much like to acknowledge um, Alain Baudet and Alan Ronald, both of whom are uh, on our board of directors. It's been fantastic guidance that we've received. We work very closely with CIHR, with IDRC, um, and ultimately what happened was an investment of $235 million um, from 2010 for a period of five, later seven years, through to 2007 to achieve the question and the challenge that I talked about early on. And um, what I'd like to do um, after just sort of giving you that organizational setup and the idea of, uh, you know, a lot of learning is to share some of the lessons that we've learned. I'll talk a little bit about our results, but I mostly want to share the lessons uh, because I think, by the way, the most valuable thing about Grand Challenges Canada is the lesson learning. It's a platform for innovation. So, you know, imagine you have a blank canvas and you're figuring out how to innovate with impact, where impact is the end goal. Some of the lessons we learn are relevant not just for Grand Challenges Canada, but for any organization in Canada or abroad who's trying to innovate and for any innovator. And I'd like to segment these lessons under three questions. What have we learned about creating a pipeline of solutions at proof of concept? Uh, say in the hundred to $250,000 range, which is what I mean by proof of concept. What have we learned about scaling the impact of these innovations in a sustainable manner? And what have we learned about developing portfolios of these innovations against specific global challenges? So the first question, what have we learned about creating a pipeline of proof of concept solutions? In 2012, um, Acumen and Monitor Group published this report that said, um, in the area of global health, there is a pioneer gap, by which they meant there was no pipeline in global health. There was very little support for innovators, particularly in low and middle income countries. And our, our particular um, customers are uh, two thirds in low and middle income countries and one third in, in Canada, the innovators that we support. Um, and what I want to say about uh, this uh, finding is that five years ago, the problem might have been that there were ideas, but no pipeline of proof of concept. That's not the problem anymore. Um, we uh, ourselves have supported 538 innovations in over 70 countries, 90% at proof of concept stage. In Canada, 200 innovations totaling $30 million, $30 million. And you see that we're already getting some early outcomes in terms of beneficiaries served, lives saved, lives improved. I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, but the point I want to make is five years ago, the problem was no pipeline. Today, there is a pipeline. There's probably about 2,000 innovations at proof of concept supported between us, Gates Foundation, USAID, other global funders, and we work very closely together. Um, but the fundamental issue of segmenting one's thinking about innovation into lots and lots and lots of proof of concept, because to be honest, 
as the writer and reviewer of many science grants, you never know what's going to happen until you actually give somebody a little money and say, prove it. So the idea of just being very retail in proof of concept, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, but little amounts of money, uh, I think is an advance on the way we normally explicitly segment our thinking. I think that's relevant to funders, and I think that's also relevant to innovators. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, one of the lessons and surprises, though, is that even though innovations are at proof of concept, they can still save lives. So here's an example of an innovation that was supported at proof of concept, $250,000, through Saving Lives at Birth, a consortium that we're in with USAID, Gates, uh, uh, Norway, and the UK. This is bubble CPAP, essentially a ventilator for newborn babies with respiratory distress. You know, out of the 6.3 million children who die under the age of five, one million die on the day of their birth, many of them from respiratory distress, no intensive care. So here's a low-cost ventilator. And with this proof of concept grant, this team from Rice University showed that bubble CPAP increased survival of newborns with respiratory distress from 24% to 65%. Now, that is a huge, huge, huge difference in uh, survival, and it shows you the life-saving potential of innovations in low- and middle-income countries. Just at proof of concept, based on those numbers, this team has probably saved the lives of 300 newborns in, uh, in uh, Malawi, where they're working. Um, the other thing we learned is that innovations are improving lives even at proof of concept. So we have a very broad view of innovation. We've supported science and technology, we've supported social innovations, we've supported business innovations, and we love to see them integrated because we think that's what's needed for sustainability and scale. Here's an example of a social enterprise, Soil Haiti, that we supported um, in Haiti. And they um, distribute toilets, and it's a business model innovation. They rent the toilets, they rent out the toilets, collect the effluent, turn the effluent into fertilizer, the fertilizer is used to grow vegetables, etc. Well, with a $100,000 grant, Soil Haiti is providing sanitation services to 22,000 people. So um, what we learned is proof of concept doesn't mean no results and no outcomes, even though it's extremely important to have a good pipeline of proof of concept. This picture is a picture of my friend Madhu Pai, who illustrates another, I think, incredibly um, interesting and worthwhile lesson that we learned, uh, which, and this is obvious, but we're not very good at it. And the lesson is that you can't innovate without failure. Uh, and we have to embrace failure, we have to learn to fail, but the key is to learn to fail fast, cheap, and to learn from it. And that's also a benefit of the proof of concept thing. So with a $100,000 grant, Madhu had an idea of a TB diagnostic. He tested it out, he executed it perfectly. It didn't have very good uh, operating characteristics. Um, you could say that that's a failure. Um, he then abandoned it two weeks later with his next idea, got $3 million from the Gates Foundation to do kind of mystery patients in tuberculosis. But the point I want to make is, and we should all be better at this, it takes really good leaders on the part of all of us innovating to say, you know what, sometimes I'm going to fail or I'm not innovating. And that's okay, and I want to model that for my students, but I want to do it fast and cheap and learn from it. And it really is a fundamentally cultural thing. And if the uh, leaders of the tribe, from an anthropological standpoint, don't embrace that culture, then that culture won't develop, which I think is why it's a very important lesson for us. So there's just some quick lessons at the level of uh, proof of concept. Next, I just want to tackle what we've learned about scaling the impact of these innovations in a sustainable manner. So, you know, we have 470 or something hundred to 250,000 uh, things in our proof of concept pipeline and 61 things in which we've put a million to two million dollars and that's what we're considering transition to scale. So it's about 10 percent and that's a venture capital way of thinking but it's also a way of mitigating the risk on public funds because when you're putting things into uh, transition to scale you already have some experience with them, they've reached proof of concept and they get to other characteristics I'll describe in a minute. Um, but the first point I want to make is that this idea of scaling, and if you will, the scaling ladder is missing some rungs. This is a challenge that every group in the world faces, and every innovator in the world faces, and it's a challenge that's not very well worked out. You know, how do you create the m paces of the world, which is maybe one of the best examples of scale in international development? That methodology is really not clear. Let me describe four models that we've learned or that we're actually observing 
on their transition to scale. The first one won't surprise you. This is scaling through public health systems. This is an example of a grant we funded again through Saving Lives at Birth with the partners I mentioned earlier, uh, chlorhexidine in Nepal. You know, chlorhexidine is a common component of mouthwash, and it's an antiseptic, and it deals with the problem of newborn death in the first 30 days of life. Forty-something percent, 44 percent of those 6.3 million kids who die under the age of five die in the newborn period, the first 30 days of life. And many of those deaths come from sepsis. And the entry point for much of that sepsis is through the umbilical cord. And so um, what we know from previous randomized trials is putting this antiseptic on the umbilical cord saves one newborn for every 200 applications, which again is a huge life-saving rate. Um, what this project was about, and it was led by JSI International, was an innovation in service delivery model with community health workers. And uh, they have reached, this is a transition to scale grant of $2 million, uh, 540,000 newborns in Nepal, and you know that that saved 2,700 lives. So if you think about it, to be saving lives with innovation after about four years is very, very quick. Think about the time frame for vaccine and stuff. One of the other learnings is some of these social and business innovations can hit their outcomes uh, a bit uh, earlier. Anyway, one model is scaling through public finance, domestic health systems in developing countries. Another model is scaling through social enterprise. So the president of the University of Guelph and a graduate student at the University of Guelph went to Cambodia and noticed there was a lot of iron deficiency anemia. Of course, if you're a woman and you're pregnant and you start with a low hemoglobin and you bleed, you're more likely to die. If you're a child with iron deficiency anemia, you're more likely to be sick. Your brain won't develop, you're listless, you can't read, you can't learn. Um, and he traced this to the idea that um, people used to cook in iron pots, they switched to aluminum, it was lighter and cheaper iron deficiency anemia. He said, what if I could give some iron back? He got iron ingots and stuck them into fishing into cooking pots and showed that the iron levels actually went up in the people who were eating the food, but nobody used them other than for doorstops and stuff. Why would you want to put some ingot of iron in your fish stew? So then he went back, uh, this graduate student from the University of Guelph, into um, a Cambodian folklore and found this little legend of the lucky fish, which you see this child holding with a little smile, cast the iron in the form of a lucky fish, put it in his social enterprise, and they sold like hotcakes. And this, he's shown that it can reduce iron deficiency anemia, proof of concept, and he's aiming to produce through this social enterprise uh, 10,000 uh, of these a year, this year in Cambodia, and we'll see where that goes. But this is basically social enterprise, social finance. The third model is scaling through small companies. So an innovator at the University of British Columbia, uh, Mark Ansarimo, had an idea for um, developing a way to measure blood oxygen on a cell phone. You know, if you go into an emergency room and have your blood oxygen measured, you've got asthma, that machine doohickey costs $1,500, $2,000. The cheapest freestanding oximeter uh, regulated by WHO costs about 400 bucks. Mark figured out how to do it with coding on the audio port of the phone. So you just put that sensor in the phone and he's got the coding and you get the, the blood oxygen saturation. This is relevant, he's shown, for preeclampsia, hypertension of pregnancy, it's a predictor. Um, but it's also obviously relevant for childhood pneumonia, the management of severe childhood pneumonia, a million kids dying of pneumonia every year. Anyway, um, along comes an angel investor, says, I'm interested in this. Uh, they spin it out into a startup company, LGT Medical. The angel investor put in a million dollars. Grand Challenges Canada matched that because this is very risky now, developing world markets, et cetera, for private investors. We de-risk that private finance. All of a sudden, you have a company in Vancouver hiring jobs in Vancouver with a humanitarian product capitalized at $2 million and now raising more, and he's already got a product on the market. So there's a small enterprise, small, small and medium enterprise version of scaling, and this is the large company version of scaling. So again, through Saving Lives at Birth, we funded this product. This is an incredible story um, of an innovator in Argentina called Jorge Odon. He's watching um, a YouTube video of a parlor trick. How do you put a wine cork in a wine bottle? How do you get it out? Well, on the YouTube video, these people put a balloon in the wine uh, bottle and then pull it through the thing because the friction is less. He went to bed that night, got up at 2 in the morning with a stroke of genius. 
He said to his wife, hey, I've got an app for that. Uh, she said, you're crazy, go to bed. But then he develops the Odon device, which is the same principle as you can see for delayed second stage of labor. So this is the first innovation in assisted vaginal delivery since forceps. And it does tackle those million kids, some of whom are dying from delayed and obstructed labor and certainly getting sick from delayed labor. Um, now forceps, you can't use deep in rural settings in sub-Saharan Africa, it requires a skilled operator, but this can be used by midwives. So we funded for 250,000. He does proof of concept to show that it's feasible. Along comes Becton Dickinson, a Fortune 500, $8 billion company uh, that had previously commercialized at a low cost uh, eject syringes, safety syringes in the developing world for giving vaccines. And they say, we'll do this. They raised a bunch of money and now they're on a three year time frame to manufacture and uh, distribute this uh, in an affordable way and they know how to do that. So very interesting story. So there's four models and this last slide, which I'll go very quickly, just shows you that it can also happen in the South. This is a uh, Chamganka, a small and medium enterprise in Kenya that we supported to develop a business model on maternity insurance and an electronic voucher model. Um, they ultimately partnered with uh, Safaricom, put this on the M-Pesa platform, and this product, maternity insurance product, now has reached 10,000 people in five months. So this is an example of business innovation. So I've reviewed five models of scaling and what we're learning. Pure public health systems, social enterprises like that lucky iron fish, small and medium enterprises like the phone oximeter and uh, large company shared value where what these companies are really doing is uh, trading off margin for markets. They want much fewer profits, but they do want profits because if it's more than social uh, responsibility, it will be much more sustainable, um, but for a very, very large number of people. So it's a commercial proposition, but one that's essentially finding new markets. Um, and uh, over $2 million, we do this through professional management. We were the anchor investor in a $10 million investment fund called the Global Health Investment Fund that was designed by and risk guaranteed by uh, Bill Gates, uh, structured by uh, JP Morgan, and you see Jamie Dimon there. And Canada was the anchor investor of a $108 million fund that has our, that launched a year ago and has made two investments in late stage companies with humanitarian technologies. One is a cholera vaccine, the other is a TB test in companies that are moving uh, forward to market. Um, so that was the second area, what have we learned about scaling? And the third area I wanna just cover very briefly is what have we learned about developing portfolios of innovations against specific global challenges? And one of the main learnings here, uh, um, and I think it's relevant for innovators, is um, so far I've only talked about individual innovations, at proof of concept and at scaling. But we found that if you actually set out to solve a challenge, like saving lives at birth, I mentioned that a number of times, like saving uh, brains, child development uh, globally, one of the main forces, I think, keeping poor countries poor, uh, like mental health, the most neglected of neglected diseases, like a problem like sanitary pads, a simple problem where if girls don't have sanitary pads, they can't go to school. If you set out to solve a, pro a problem like that globally, it makes sense actually to collect a community of innovators, and we learned this in the original Grand Challenges, who are doing a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning from each other and accelerating uh, their collective innovations. And that's what really this is uh, idea is about. And here's an example of saving lives at birth um, that shows you, it's the one I mentioned earlier uh, with the partners at, along the bottom, that trusting partnerships really are required to solve these global challenges. No one organization, company, country working alone can solve the types of challenges that we're facing. So uh, partnerships are really, really key. And you can see the type of high level commitment to this. There's Melinda Gates and Hillary Clinton and other people, um, uh, high level commitment to this with one, one exception um, that countries are, are making to these kind of uh, partnerships globally. And just to say, you know, Alain himself has led one of these partnerships, the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease, that's worked on problems like hypertension and, uh, and uh, diabetes, and I'm sure he'd have similar thoughts. Um, also, these global challenges can cross disciplines. So this is our Saving Brains program. It's the 200 million children who never reach their full potential 
because their brains are messed up in the first thousand days of life from malnutrition, from lack of stimulation and reading and singing to children, and of course from terrible things that happen to children, conflict, maltreatment, etc. And um, this is a great example because it doesn't matter if a child's well nourished if they're beaten or in a war zone. It doesn't matter if a child's well nourished if nobody reads to them and there's no responsive parenting. And one of the things that really surprised me is, um, you know, the effect of not responding to a young child in the first thousand days of life uh, when the child is uh, interacting with the parent or another trusted caregiver is just as bad for the brain as malnourishing that child. Uh, anyway, huge social problem, and you can only solve this in a cross-disciplinary way with communities of innovators. Um, this slide is too complicated to really read. This is from our global mental health program, but it just makes the point that when you have a community of innovators and you're on a 10-year trajectory to solve a global challenge, you actually need the metrics to know whether you're solving that challenge. So one of the investments we make separate from the projects is on these platforms to develop those kind of metrics that are then applied to the projects that answer the question collectively, how is this community of innovators doing solving this challenge. So what I'm getting at here is the importance of metrics, the importance of communities of innovators, and it's not traditionally, to be honest, the way I think we think in what's normally an individual game, uh, which, is, uh, which is innovation. Um, this slide, again, too complicated really to understand in detail, but it's making the point that each of these organizations, Grand Challenges Canada, USAID, Gates Foundation, CIHR, others, they have their own pipelines of innovations, but they never meet in one place, and there's no real place where investors, for example, which could be public or private investors who are interested in taking these innovations to scale can actually see the full pipeline regardless of the provenance of the innovation. And that's a problem we're trying to solve with these groups by, uh, by developing what we're calling a global innovation marketplace to bring networks of investors to this pipeline of innovations. And again, what you're seeing here is the importance of a type of infrastructure and a type of collective effort to really make the individual innovations that we have, each of us, successful. So ask yourself what kind of infrastructure you have and what kind of community of innovators you have and what kind of metrics you have to actually, um, and what kind of access to investors you have that are interested in your topic to actually move things forward for you. I want to end on this slide. This is my second last slide, and we'll have a little bit of time for uh, uh, questions. Um, I want to end on this slide. This is the assessment that John uh, kindly referenced, uh, the global health assessment that was done by the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, and a number of people in the room were uh, panelists on this assessment. Um, I think the most important contribution of this assessment was to make the point that global health does not mean those poor people over there but rather that there's a view of global that truly is global, that embraces low and middle income countries and domestic constituencies who are facing the same problems. We specifically referenced Aboriginal health in the assessment, but to take a concrete example, the problems of early child development and the issues of children not reaching their full potential, if you're in Canada, that's Fraser Mustard. If you're overseas, that's saving brains and Grand Challenges Canada, and kind of never the twain shall meet. And that's really stupid, uh, because imagine the power of not only taking ideas from the north and translating them to the south, but ideas from the south and translating them to the north. And that applies here, it applies to mental health, it applies to any topic we might want to challenge. And just to end up with uh, kind of, uh, we've seen the enemy and it's ourselves, one of the things um, that we've reflected on and seen is that the pipeline of innovations that come out of people who are innovating, and remember, 200 of these are Canadians, and about 300 of them are from low and middle income countries, that are innovating for low and middle income countries, is that these innovations are accessible and affordable. Think about that example of the phone oximeter. They solve not just the problems of what we see as global health, but our primary problem which is the cost of health services, the access of Aboriginal communities. Um, and so we don't have that cycle anywhere right. There is actually no kind of systematic approach to taking that opportunity. And to my mind, um, that's the next great revolution in global health. And we've taken some early steps um, with LN's leadership, with CIHR. We are collaborating to try and bring those worlds together. But if there's one message I could leave with, it's this one. 
because global health doesn't mean those poor people over there. It means all the people in the world who are suffering from a given condition that can be made better by innovation. And uh, that's really um, the key message that I want to take. I mean, one of the things that I, 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 I also learned is that it's not about the innovation. It's about the impact. Innovation is the highway. Impact is the destination. And obviously, if you, um, uh, by learning some of these lessons, we found that we can increase our chances of success uh, for the innovators. In innovation, the uh, odds are piled against you. So you need to do everything that you can to increase your chance of actually reaching that impact. And this slide just is a thank you slide that says, and this comes back to Paul because he's so good at teamwork and making people feel included, that nothing can be accomplished without a great team. And you see them here, uh, board, partners, funders, and just at the end, a particular shout out to the Government of Canada. It's been uh, such a privilege, certainly on my behalf, and I know our whole board and team and everyone else feels this way, to be entrusted with this public resource, A, to try and turn it into as much impact as possible in as short a time as possible, and B, to capture some of these lessons in innovation that we hope in the fullness of time could be of some use to other people trying to do innovation on the funding side and on the innovation side in Canada and around the world. And what a privilege for me um, to be able to share some of these lessons learned uh, with you um, uh, in the name of uh, Paul Armstrong, someone uh, for whom I have such great respect. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions and comments. Thank you very much. So we will take a couple of minutes. Uh, questions? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Diane. That was great, Peter. It's wonderful to see what progress you've made over such a short period of time. And uh, a great illustration of some of the principles I was talking about yesterday when it comes to comp solutions to complex problems. A lot of them were seen there. My question is uh, from the point of view of a provincial funder in Canada that has a, a significant uh, focus on our own healthcare system in BC as an example. And I wonder if you can comment on how translatable some of your lessons learned are in a system where things like like failure is pretty hard to accept by the powers that be in the system. Uh, it's an excellent question. I think the lessons are completely translatable. The question is to what extent you can execute on that translation. And that's fundamentally a cultural issue. Um, you know, we had the privilege of setting up a system that had additionality rather than changing an existing system that people had been used to for many years. Um, and the constraints to change are huge. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and anyone who runs an organization that's not a startup, and this was a startup, understands that. Having said that, I think the lessons are translatable, and smart execution can at least help some of those lessons uh, come into play. But fundamentally, what you're dealing with is a cultural issue. And I think the way to shift the culture is to focus on the end beneficiary. You know, if you put the focus away from the papers and the patents and the this and the that and the, like, who, gives a, who cares about promotion? And if you take that attitude and just say, how, I'm, apologies to all the people who are deans in the room. If you just, uh, <laughs> if you just take that attitude and say, imagine the one person you want to serve. And each of us, well, for me, it's a young uh, baby I met in a favela in Rio who was in a daycare center in the middle of a slum. And uh, she was thriving because she was getting nourishment, she was getting stimulation. And that is my mental image of the person I want to help. And I want to help the brains of kids like that develop. If we can get into a mindset like that, and each of us will have a different mental image, um, and away from all the other incentives that we've created to chain ourselves in, um, then maybe there can be some breakthrough in the question, the outstanding question that you asked. We've got one time for one more question, yes. Um, I'm just wondering how things um, float to the top here in terms of um, the, co the types of concerns that get addressed given there are many grand challenges and widespread social problems. That's an outstanding question. I mean, we started off, our strategy was to say, um, start humbly and say, we're not the smartest person in the room, so, uh, but at the same time, focus is important. 
So about half our funds go to three targeted challenges, saving lives at birth, saving brains, global mental health. And the way we selected those three was we were looking for areas that are neglected where Canada with its limited resources can be transformational. So for example, we started down the path of diagnostics. You can't compete with the Gates Foundation in diagnostics. Impossible. Still useful on an individual basis, but you can't, and the whole diagnostics industry, but you can compete on a holistic look at early child development because nobody else is taking that holistic look, or global mental health. By spending $30 million on innovation in mental health in low and middle income countries, Canada's become one of the top three funders in innovation in mental health in low and middle income countries. That tells, says more about the problem than about uh, uh, anything else, given that a single malaria vaccine costs $2 billion. So those are the types of things, and I won't bore you with the very elaborate process through the board, et cetera, that we used to uh, pick those three areas, and it won't have escaped you that two of the three are in maternal child health, which is Canada's top development priority. Um, the other half, though, we said we're not the smartest people in the room. Great ideas are everywhere, and let a thousand flowers bloom. And that's our STARS program, where we've received about 460 projects now that we funded $100,000. That's an incredible pipeline of uh, innovation. And just to give you an example of what the benefits of one of those projects is, or that type of open approach, so 16 months ago, we funded an innovator at Makara University, Wayangara Misaki. His idea was, why don't I find some biomarkers for Marburg and Ebola and see if maybe I can validate those biomarkers? Well, 16 months later, as of yesterday, he sent us his data package, and he's got a 16-month head start on anybody else who wants to develop a rapid diagnostic test. And imagine how useful that would be to the public health infrastructure to have those people in spacesuits be able to actually screen people with a rapid diagnostic test at point of screening, because that doesn't exist now. So all of a sudden, everybody and their brother, the Gates Foundation, the U.S. Army, everyone else descends on Wayangara, Misaki, and us. And, you know, I don't know. It's early stage. Uh, the biomarker uh, may pan out. It may not. We may be able to turn it into a prototype. We may not. It may be validated. It may not. Um, but he's got a 16-month head start. And if that project is successful, arguably, it will almost have made the whole investment worthwhile depending on the level of success. And that's the kind of um, venture capital mindset and the kind of humility in strategy that I think one needs to take. You set the table, but it's the innovators who innovate. And you just create the space for them to do so, including the innovators from low and middle income countries who've never had the opportunity to be supported like this. You know, maybe just to end with one last story, one of my um, proudest moments was in Tanzania where I went and I was sitting beside the Director General of the National Institute of Medical Research, Alain's uh, counterpart in Tanzania, and we were watching the presentation of the new uh, winners of STARS grants in Tanzania, and up comes this young woman who has this solution of sprinkling some powder into water and it disinfects the water, and uh, Muele kind of nudges me in the, in the ribs and says, Peter, you see that um, young woman? innovator? Well, all her colleagues said, your idea is crazy. You will never be successful. But she soldiered on, she got her grant funded, and, uh, and um, when you see the sense of pride of that young women, woman who's innovating to make things better for her family, for her community, she's beaming with pride. And by the way, about three months ago, her proof of concept results showed that that sprinkling, that little magic powder actually does sanitize the water. I have no idea how. Um, you know, uh, that makes it all worthwhile. So that's the kind of strategy one has to take. Um, and, uh, okay, one last thing. At proof of concept, you're looking, you're asking about selection. I'm now going down to the level of projects from programs. At proof of concept, one of the things we learned is you're looking for the idea. Is that a cool idea and could it work? Think about the Ebola biomarkers. At transition to scale, you're looking at a completely different thing. You're really looking at, is this someone who will stick to it, be an entrepreneur when kicked in the face, lying bleeding on the floor, get up and keep doing their thing? And do they have the right partners, the smart partners who will make this scale? And do they have a business plan such that they know what's going to happen when the last Government of Canada dollar is invested? It's a completely different set of questions. Plus, did they reach proof of concept and what happened to the science and have that informed by scientific peer review? And by the way, um, CIHR, and we're very, very um, 
uh, pleased with that and, and, and grateful for it, um, d does or validates all of our, uh, our peer reviews. So that idea at the project level of you're actually looking for different things in proof of concept and scaling is maybe the place that I'll end um, just to say what a privilege it is to be able to address you and to have um, stewarded along with many others uh, this very precious public resource and hopefully, and it's an unfolding story because innovation's not a four-year game, it's a 10-year game, hopefully um, we will get the type of really um, hit products we're already seeing results uh, and more fundamentally, the lessons that can be used to improve innovation in Canada more generally and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.